talk about musical sounds, and we probably ought to start by thinking about how you describe a musical sound. Well, there are many ways in which it can be done. One of my favorites uh, is to use uh, cartoons. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, Gerard Hoffman's cartoons illustrating a thud. And uh, I think it's quite a graphic sort of description. This is, uh, the next one is Gerard Hoffman's description of a ping, <laughs> which is equally graphic. Uh, the next one is the sort of thing that hi-fi enthusiasts dread, a hum. <laughs> Uh, there's another cartoonist, too, who's done a lot of work of this kind, and that's Saul Steinberg, the American cartoonist. Uh, and this is one of his. Um, I think you'd agree that that particular double bass player is obviously very confident. Uh, he's producing a very strong, incisive sort of sound, and you can really hear him, you know, being really confident about it. Hoffnung had a go at a double bass, but his was a lot more tentative. It's this one. <laughs> But I think really in this category, my favorite of all the cartoons is a Saul Steinberg. It's this one. <laughs> and I think if ever you talked about hearing with your eyes, this is it. You can really hear that lovely fruity oomph sound coming out of the tuba without actually any sound at all. Well, that's maybe a little bit frivolous, but it's one way in which you can describe musical sounds. Musicians use a slightly more serious way of doing it. Uh, this is a typical description of a musical sound, and if you put that in front of any reasonably competent orchestra, they would probably produce roughly the same sort of sound. Uh, and therefore, you might think it was fairly precise. Well, it is fairly precise in the sense that the pitches are fairly well defined, the position of the notes on the stave, and the time durations, the, the shapes of the notes, are fairly well defined. But it's very imprecise as far as tonal quality is concerned. Because, you see, the only indication of the differences in quality are the initials on the left-hand edge. Starting at the top, we've got flute, oboe, clarinet, etc. Uh, and that is really a very imprecise description. If we go down to the third and fourth lines from the bottom, they're bracketed together and they're just given the initials VL for violin. I've never yet seen a score which said violin bracket Stradivarius type. And what I'm going to do to start with is just to play one or two recordings. Many of you will have seen this before, I'm quite sure. But what I want you to try to do is to relate what you hear with what you see on the screen. And uh, in true university style, after I've shown you one or two, we'll have a test to see how well you've got on. Uh, well, here's the first of those uh, recordings coming up now. That's the recording I always take with me, and then if you hadn't turned up, I could have played it to myself and <laughs> pretended I had an audience because in fact it was an audience turning up to a lecture that I was going to give. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that if you looked at the screen, it was really a more or less formless jumble, wasn't it? It would be very difficult to describe what you saw, except for a lot of spikes or squiggles or using some expression of that kind. And yet, listening to the record, you could hear the odd cough, the odd giggle, all sorts of conversation going on, and you could actually pick those different things out. You could, you, I don't know whether you noticed, but there was one particular giggle at one point which, which stood out quite strongly. And yet, if you're looking at the screen, there was only one wave trace. In other words, the pressure only has one value at one moment in time. And this is a quite remarkable thing, really. See, if, supposing there was a baby crying out there and a dog barking out there and a fire engine going by outside, uh, you would probably notice those different sounds, but provided it wasn't your baby and your dog and it wasn't your house that's on fire, you'll probably go on listening to what I'm saying uh, without being too disturbed, uh, unless it got too loud. And yet, you see, the various pressure changes that those different sources of sound are producing just add together. And what finally gets to your ear is just the sum of the lot. 
and that's why on the screen we just saw one trace. And yet the ear brain system is able to take that trace and disentangle the, the components. And if you're listening to an orchestra, you can pick out the violin or the oboe or whatever. And uh, we have some idea about how that's done, but we're not by any means convinced that we know the whole story. Later on, I'll come on to that. Well, that's one sort of sound. See if you can see on the screen what the difference is between that and the one that I'm going to play you now. Well, um, what were the differences? Well, you could probably see some sort of change with the rhythm, and you might therefore have deduced that it was music if you were looking at it, but it was still a pretty random jumble of squiggles. What was it on the screen that told you that that was Mendelssohn, as opposed to Beethoven or Bach? Do you think if I showed you a trace without the sound, you could tell who the composer was? Uh, I have a slight suspicion that you wouldn't be able to do. But nevertheless, you see, all the information is there. The same information that you're getting via your ear uh, normally is there via the visual channel, and it doesn't really do you a great deal of good. Here's a different sort of sound. Well there, I think you might have deduced that that was pop music because you could see a fairly steady beat. But whether you could have told that it was the Pink Floyd if you didn't know, I'm not sure. Well now at this point what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the loudspeakers so that you can't hear the next one. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to show you it and let's see if you can then deduce what sort of a sound it is and if it's music, who the composer is, etc. <laughs> Here it comes now. <coughs> well, there we are. You are getting all the information that you need, you see, on the screen. Now, uh, any bids? What, what do you think it was? Anybody think it was uh, pop music? No. no? Classical music, somebody said. Classical violin. Any, any other bids? Well, <laughs> well, you see, we've got all kinds of bids there. What I'll do is I'll put the loudspeakers back on again, and, and we'll play exactly the same recording again, and you can see and hear exactly what it was. <laughs> well, as you could hear, it was in fact an orchestra tuning up. <laughs> and um, I chose that deliberately because it, in a way, sums up the problem of uh, psychoacoustic research, you see, because that was music in the sense that it was made by musical instruments, but it was noise in the sense that you wouldn't pay whatever the going rate is in Sydney to listen to that for more than a few minutes. It's all right for perhaps uh, two or three minutes at the beginning of the program to whet your appetite, but I don't know of any, even the most avant-garde composer that's ever actually used that <laughs> as part of a symphony or something of that kind. So, you see, it really begins to focus this problem, just what is music, if it isn't the noise made by musical instruments? Uh, well, we could go on talking about that for most of the evening, but I don't intend to. On the whole, my view of music is that it's, it's sort of sounds made by musical instruments that you want to hear. And if you, if, it, if you don't want to hear it, then it isn't music at that particular time. And if you're trying to do your homework, 
when somebody next door is playing the most beautiful music, which you're really very fond of, as far as you're concerned, that can be noise because it's distracting you from what you want to do. And you've either got to decide to go away and, and do your homework or give up and listen to the music. It's got to be one or the other. And so, uh, in my book, music is sounds made by musical instruments that I want to hear uh, or, or that uh, somebody else wants to hear. Well, of course, up to now, we've really been looking at very, very complicated sorts of sound, mixtures of enormous amounts of sound. And the other thing that we probably ought to do is to go right to the other end of the spectrum, if I can use that word, and have a look at some very, very simple musical sounds. And the simplest sort of musical sound that one could imagine is what a physicist would call a pure tone, a musician might call it a, a steady note, a mathematician might call it a sine wave, and it looks and sounds like this. I'll just speed up the oscilloscope a bit so that you can see it better. And as you can see, it's absolutely regular. It's repeating regularly in time. You can imagine this going on forever, never changing. And it can be described with really just two numbers. Uh, one, one to tell you how big it is, and the other to tell you how many repeats there are every second. And that's really all you need to know. The other simplest kind of sound was the one that crept in just at the end there this sort of thing. And that is what a physicist would call white noise. It's completely random. Again, you could imagine it going on forever, and whereas the first one had, perhaps it was very dull physically, but it did have a definite pitch associated with it, this one has no pitch associated with it. Well, uh, we could go on for quite a long time looking at the various ways in which the size is related to the noise and so on and so forth. Uh, there's just one that I think we ought to just demonstrate, and that is how the pitch, the musical pitch that we hear, is related to the frequency that we measure, the number of uh, vibrations every second. There's the sine wave again. And you can see how they're related. Uh, we'll go down now instead of up. And I think you can see that, roughly speaking, well, in fact, it's precise, but you can only see it roughly, uh, that if you double the frequency, you go up an octave. If you halve the frequency, you go down an octave. Uh, well, in some ways, that's about as far as we need to go in thinking about simple musical sounds because we've already got enough information to start making a musical instrument. All we need is to make variations in the pressure of the air that are regular and if we want to play tunes we need to make them either more rapid or less rapid, high frequency or low frequency in order to play tunes. So we've got enough information to start making simple instruments. Um, I've got here some couple of brass rods. They're um, just about uh, five millimeters and they're solid. Um, I have resin on my gloves. And what I'm going to do is to find, first of all, the midpoint by a subsidiary, very scientific experiment. And then having found it, I'm going to stroke the rod like that. And I think you can hear that we get quite a loud sound. I've lost, lost the midpoint. There we are. And it persists for quite a long time. Uh, what is happening? Well, resin has very peculiar frictional properties. It has a very low dynamic friction. If the two surfaces are moving together, it's quite low friction. But if it's static, if the two things are, are not moving, then the friction is very high. So what happens when I first grip the rod, it's static friction, very high, and so when I pull, I actually stretch the rod by a very small amount. Having stretched it by a very small amount, then the, the forces in the rod overcome the friction and it starts to move. And once it starts to move, it goes on moving because the, of the low dynamic friction.
uh, and it moves for a while and then starts to come back again and as it comes back it goes at the same speed as my glove and so my glove as it were picks it up again. So we keep getting this sticking and slipping. In fact we call it stick slip motion, it's very logical and um, it's much the same as the motion you get if you're playing a violin with a bow. The bow picks up the string, pulls it to one side, then it slips back, pulls it to one side again, slips back and so on. Well every time it slips a little pulse travels to one end of the rod, travels back again and travels up again and goes backwards and forwards being reinforced by the glove each time and each time it gets to the end of course it sends out a little pressure wave and because it takes the same time every time to go up and down we get a regular series of pressure waves. So if we want to make a higher pitch note what we want is a shorter piece of rod so it takes less time to run up and down. Well we just listen to that one again to get that note in mind and if I now take a slightly shorter piece of rod and do that we get a higher pitch. So in principle uh, all we need to make a musical instrument is to have a whole collection of those of different lengths and then when you want to play a tune you just pick them up uh, find the midpoint and stroke them. <laughs> You're limited to slow Welsh hymn tunes <laughs> but otherwise it's quite a good way of, of playing music. Well, but it is in fact typical of one class of musical instrument which is a very important one. The harp, the xylophone, the piano, the organ all belong to that class. That's the class of instruments where you have a separate vibrator for each note you want to play. And in fact from a scientific point of view the piano is not one instrument, it's 88 separate instruments, each of which has only one note. And you bring them into operation by pressing the appropriate key at the appropriate time. Well the second category of instruments instead of having one vibrator for each note just has one vibrator and then you do something to it. You either change its shape or its state of tension in order to change the pitch. And my member of that family is this one. Uh, this is just an ordinary uh, wood saw um, but if we um, treat it in the right sort of way which means in fact that we um, clamp it firmly between the knees like that, bend it into an S shape and the S is the important bit. When it's in an S shape this middle bit which is more or less flat is suspended on two springs you see and it can flap backwards and forwards and if we now bow it we get quite a loud sound and this middle bit is simply flapping backwards and forwards vibrating in a regular way but this time I can change the pitch by changing the bend. If I alter this bend, tighten it up a bit then it's going to vibrate more rapidly. And so we can get a number of different notes out of one uh, vibrator. Now the saw is uh, a, a sort of music hall type instrument it's usually used for playing very romantic love songs <laughs> and uh, um, a love song really needs excessive vibrato uh, which you get by allowing your right heel down here <laughs> to wobble <laughs> like this. or something like that. <laughs> well I'm sure you don't want to listen to that for very long. <laughs> it's a dreadful so noise but it does illustrate the point you see. There is a single vibrator which we can do things to to get different notes and uh, there are quite a lot of instruments in that category. The, all the woodwinds where you have the air in the column is the, the primary thing and uh, you're changing the shape of the air column or the length if you like by uh, putting your fingers on the keys or taking them off. So you're altering the shape of the air column. The violin, you're, or all the string family, you're altering the length of the string. Now somebody's going to say but a violin has four strings. Well that's simply because one string doesn't have a big enough range so you need more 
in order to cover the whole range. But in principle, that's the second category. Now, if instead of bowing, uh, instead of altering the bend, if I keep the bend the same, but bow at different places, you hear I'm getting quite different notes depending on where I bow. But what's happening there is that I'm forcing the saw to vibrate in different modes or patterns of oscillation, as we would call it. Uh, and the third big family of musical instruments uses that change of mode in order to change the pitch of the note. And uh, my member of that family is this one, which is three and a half meters of garden hose pipe. <coughs> <coughs> and if I, well you can see that it isn't a member of the first family because I've only got one. It isn't a member of the second family because I'm not going to bend it or twist it or do anything with it. All I'm going to do is to change the pattern of vibration inside the pipe. <coughs> and we can get a whole sequence of notes simply by changing the pattern inside the pipe. And of course, uh, as you know, the, the bugle does it that way. Uh, the uh, trumpet and uh, the tubers and so on use a combination of that and change of shape because the gaps between those notes are fairly considerable and you, you need to fill them up. Uh, so there's the third major family in the orchestra. The percussion, of course, is a very important component, but percussion is very difficult to understand. Uh, it's much more complicated than any of the simple melodic instruments, and uh, there just isn't time. There won't be time to deal with all the melodic ones. So I'm afraid percussion has got to uh, take a back seat as far as tonight is concerned. Well now, <coughs> the next question we might ask is, just what exactly do we mean by this change of mode, change of pattern. And it's important to understand that because it comes in to when we start talking about the quality of musical sound. And to illustrate that, uh, I'm going to use this piece of soft rubber rope. And I have a volunteer already lined up who is going to act as the anchor at this end. And um, you can imagine, if you like, that this is a large scale model of a guitar string. And if you pluck the guitar string, that's what happens. You can see, I think, the wave which is traveling up and down. And I think you can feel every time the wave comes back, it thumps the, 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 the bridge. You're the bridge at the moment. Uh, and of course, each time it thumps the bridge, it, it will move the whole of the sounding board. And so we get a series of pulses at regular intervals. Now, that's a fairly complicated motion. A much simpler motion is that. And if you get that frequency in mind, it's the same as the rate at which that wave is traveling up and down. It's what we call the fundamental frequency of the rope. But now if I make the, ro the rope vibrate at exactly twice that frequency, then we get a very, quite a different pattern. And I think you can see now that it's got a stable, it's a stable pattern. We would call that the second mode of vibration. And you see that near the middle there, there's a place where nothing much is happening. Uh, we call that, it's one of those corny jokes that physicists sometimes make, we call the point in the middle a node, which is short for node displacement. And uh, you can see that there's nothing much happening there. Now if I go at three times the frequency, we get another quite well-defined mode, quite stable, and now there are two places where nothing much is happening. And if I go at four times the frequency, we get another one. You see, with three times, it gets more difficult, but I think you can <laughs> just, about, just about see it. I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, well, as you can see, roughly speaking, we have modes in the ratio one, two, three, four. And this is where we have to make one of those dreadful proviso statements. If the anchor at, at both ends had been much more rigid, and this is no reflection on our friend here. If the string had been more flexible, completely flexible in fact, and so on and so forth, then we would have had a sequence one, two, three, four, five, six, as far as you like. 
in, in practice with real strings, they soon begin to depart from that perfect series, but I don't think that really need concern us too much tonight. Um, and since mathematicians refer to that sort of sequence, one, two, three, four, five, as a harmonic sequence, then we tend to call those harmonics. But of course it is important to remember that they're only harmonics if they have that nice, neat frequency ratio, one, two, three, four, five. If it goes one, two, three, three point nine, uh, four point six, and so on, as it sometimes does with real strings, then we can't anymore call them harmonics, we have to call them overtones or partial vibrations. Well, um, just to uh, uh, complete the, that picture, let's just have a look uh, on, the, uh, on a slide at what those uh, harmonics would sound like if we started with a frequency, uh, the, the, no the numbers just underneath the notes there are the frequencies and we got 55, 110, 165 the numbers on the next row are the harmonic numbers, one, two, three, four, etc. Right down at the bottom you can see the musical intervals, the octave, the fifth, the fourth, and as we go up the harmonic scale with the intervals get less and less, and you can see on, on the stave there we have the corresponding musical notation. And I'm going to play a recording now of exactly what those sound like, starting with the 55, which would be pretty low frequency, pretty low pitch rather, and uh, then we've got the scale. That's 55, that's 110, that's 165, 220, we're now two octaves above where we started, 275, 330, 385, a rather nasty note, and 440, three octaves above where we started, 495, and 550. Those are the first ten harmonics. And as you can see, they all fit onto the normal musical scale that we're familiar with, except number seven, which doesn't really quite fit. It, it's, it's a little bit out of tune, and uh, thereby hangs quite a, a long and I'm not sure that we really thoroughly understand <laughs> why that is. There are lots of things in this topic that we don't understand. And uh, in a way, I think that's one of its fascinations. There are so many things that we don't thoroughly understand. Uh, there's plenty of scope for more people to come in and, and help us to sort it out. Well, the sounds I've been making so far are not really very pleasant. The, the brass rods and the saw and the host pipe and even those harmonics pure tones though they were, are not very pleasant. What is the difference between those sort of sounds and the kind of sound that is made by uh, a good violin or a clarinet and so on and so forth? Well, for a long time it was thought that the principal change was that in a, a real instrument like a violin or a clarinet, the vibrator is not just vibrating in one mode, it's vibrating in several modes at once. So you're really hearing a kind of chord. And you remember at the beginning when I plucked the string, I said that's rather a complicated oscillation. That could be really regarded as the sum of a whole lot of others. And I just want to demonstrate what happens if we add a series of waves. And if you look at the screen, I think you'll see what happens. And if you listen, you'll hear the change in quality as we add in harmonics. There's the fundamental. Now we add the second harmonic to it, and you can see the change in shape, and I think you can hear the change in quality. Now we're adding the third harmonic, and now the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and now we've got a sort of sawtooth type wave, you see? Now we're taking them away again. And you can hear that we get a kind of wah-wah sound. And in fact, uh, I believe that um, people who play the electric guitar uh, have a thing called a wah-wah pedal. 
which in fact just increases and decreases the number of harmonics as we were doing there. Well, um, it turns out that if you look into this a bit more carefully, that you can make almost any wave shape by adding up the various harmonics, and you can make almost any quality of sound uh, by doing it. So, it looks as though we're beginning to get somewhere by uh, mixing harmonics and thinking of that as a means of changing the quality from one instrument to another. Unfortunately, like so many things, it doesn't turn out to be quite as simple as that. And those of you who are old enough to remember pre-war electronic organs, I mean, you've heard them post-war, I'm not suggesting you're as old as all that, but um, uh, there are plenty of pre-war organs around. Uh, you'll know that um, if you, they, they have stops on them, which are labeled clarinet, diapase, and flute, and so on, it doesn't really matter which one you pull out, it sounds exactly like an electronic organ. <laughs> and um, the question is, why is that? Why does it sound like an electronic organ? Even though, if you actually take the trace that is being produced, it may look exactly the same as the trace from a clarinet or a flute. Uh, well, one of the reasons for that uh, is that for some reason which I've never really understood, in the period between the two wars, people looked at these wave traces, but they only looked at relatively short bits of them. And this, I think, was the, the, the mistake. Uh, here's a picture of the kind of wave trace that they would look at. And you see this sort of thing in many books that were written between the two wars. And the top trace would be labeled flute, the middle one clarinet, and the bottom one guitar. And you can see that they repeat exactly. If you follow the flute one, the little wobble is at the same place, and it's absolutely repeating, precisely. And this led people in that sort of period to think, oh well, it's just an exact repetition. We can analyze that into its harmonic components, and, and there's the answer. This, this is why we're getting that particular quality of sound. But, um, just have a look at what happens if we, instead of taking just that little bit, which is only a hundredth of a second, if we take a tenth of a second's worth. Look what happens now. Can you see that they're not really repeating quite regularly? There are wobbles on them, and particularly the bottom one, the guitar, I think you can see that it's not like a repeat. And if we go to one whole second's worth, instead of a tenth of a second as that was, you see how, what happens then. All the waves are squashed up, you can see how they begin, the flute begins with a different sort of shape from the clarinet, they've both got wobbles on them, and the guitar, of course, behaves in a completely different way. Now let's just have a look for comparison at a synthetic waveform. Just have a look at the top one and the third one down. That's electronically generated, and you see how absolutely uniform it is. Uh, and if we squash that one up, like we did with the, on the last slide, you can see that it's still very uniform, absolutely uniform. And one of the clues seems to be that the human brain uh, seems to like a little bit of imperfection. You see, it, 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 we, we know our fellow men and women. <laughs> we know that they're never going to produce absolute perfection. And so if we hear something which is absolutely uniform, we say, ah, that's not a human being, that's not an animal, that's a machine. If you're out in the, in the country and uh, you hear a high-pitched whine or a hum, something of that sort, you would never dream of thinking that it was an animal making that noise. You know immediately that it's an electrical transformer or a pump or something like that. It, it's mechanical. It's much too perfect to be, have a human being involved with it. And so I think that's one of the answers, but it's only part of the answer. The main part of the answer is in that beginning bit. You saw how differently the note started. And it turns out that the way the note starts is probably the most profound difference between one instrument and another. If we take a tuning fork, for example, uh, you don't hear very much if you just hit it and hold it up like that, because the prongs of the fork are not really big enough to make a big pressure change. But if I put it on the bench, then of course we hear quite a loud sound. And what you have to ask yourself is what exactly is happening there? The tuning fork is vibrating, the prongs are vibrating in and out, so the bottom of the fork is coming up and down, and so that will make the bench vibrate. So 
If it can get the whole bench to vibrate, we get a very big change in pressure and so there's a big sound. But the fork has to work hard to get the bench to cooperate. The bench uh, has what physicists would call inertia, what perhaps we would call humanly laziness, which we all suffer from from time to time, and the bench just doesn't want to move. And the fork has a, quite a battle with it, trying to get it to move. And it takes perhaps a tenth of a second or even a little longer for the fork to actually get the bench to move. And if you listen very carefully, I think you can hear the, the argument, as it were, going on between the fork and the bench. Could you hear a distinct change in quality just at the beginning? There's a quite distinct change, and the beginning part is when the bench, the fork is trying to persuade the bench to vibrate, and all sorts of strange waves are going backwards and forwards, and eventually the bench agrees, as it were, to vibrate, and so it all settles down. But that bit at the beginning we, we, is what we call the starting transient, starting because it's when the note starts, and transient because it doesn't last very long, uh, is all important. Um, this is uh, a bagpipe chanter, but I'm going to pretend it's an oboe for tonight, and <coughs> the reed makes a little <coughs> squeaky sound like that. But if I put it on the pipe, uh, we get, uh, we can control the pitch. Now the sort of question that you have to ask is, if that's what the reed does on its own, and that's what it does on the pipe, what makes the reed change its motion when it's on the pipe? How does it know that it's on the pipe uh, in order to make that different sound? And what actually happens is that the reed is really behaving like a little tap. It's opening and shutting and letting little puffs of air through regularly. Uh, and the first little puff of air that goes in travels down until it finds an open hole. And then it expands through the open hole. The air behind it expands and the air behind that and so on. So what went down as a, an increase in pressure comes back as a decrease. And if it just happens that the decrease in pressure arrives back here just as the reed is shutting, ready for another one to come down, then, and it's in step, then we shall get a continuation of the motion. Um, it's what we call a kind of resonance. I'm sure you've uh, had the experience of pushing a swing, a child on a swing. And if you just push at the right moment, you don't need to do very much work. You can build up quite a, a big oscillation. But if you push at the wrong moment, if you try to push that way when the swing's coming that way, you end up on the floor, uh, and it's quite disastrous. Well, in the same way, the, the reed has got to find out, and it's got to operate at the same frequency as the pipe. And this takes time. It can take anything up to a tenth or even a fifth of a second to settle down. And this is one of the reasons why, when you're learning to play an instrument like the oboe, you make such terrible noises terrible squeaks and squawks, because most players are trying to force the reed to do what they want to do. What you've really got to do is to learn to cooperate. You need a three-way cooperation between you, the reed, and the pipe. And you've got to give the reed enough freedom, as it were, to find out what the right length is. And of course you can help it, and the more skilled you are, the more you can help it to get to the right frequency quickly. But it always takes time. And in fact, this is... Uh, uh, a slide showing this particular uh, chanter playing a steady note and these little spikes of course are the separate pulses and I think you can see that at this end it's really quite irregular and it's nearly two-thirds of the way across before it actually settles down and becomes absolutely regular. So this first two-thirds is all the starting transient and the rest is the steady part. And it turns out that the ear and brain together are much more interested in that starting bit than anything else. And what seems to happen is that the ear and brain hear that little starting bit and they say, ah yes, this is going to be a bagpipe chanter, so I needn't bother with the rest, and so the, the brain turns off and looks around for something else. Uh, and this is one of the clues to why you can listen to all the different bits of the orchestra. You hear the various starting transients and that tells you what, what's happening.
But then, after a little while, you come back and the brain sort of checks back to see if it really was what it thought it was. Uh, and this is a very complicated hearing process that goes on. And uh, I think I can illustrate that probably uh, most uh, um, effectively uh, with this little recording. Some of you, I'm sure, will recognize what it is straight away, but if you do, don't tell anybody else. Um, see if you can deduce what kind of an instrument this is. I'm sure many of you would recognize what that was, but uh, some of you might not have done. Uh, what we did, in fact, what I did, was to play a piano starting with the last note of a piece and playing back from the last note to the beginning. And then we turned the tape round so that the tune came out the right way round, but all the notes come out back to front. Now, the typical way in which a piano note starts is a very sudden like the guitar that we had on earlier on. A very sudden start and then a slow decay. So if you turn it back to front, we get a slow rise and a sudden decay. Uh, and so uh, what was happening there is that you were getting, you were hearing the slow rise. And I think if you hadn't heard that sort of thing before, you might have thought it was a harmonium with a leaky bellows or something of that sort, an organ type instrument. And yet the more you listen to it, the more you realize it isn't that. And the reason you think it is at first is that the starting is exactly the way an organ starts. The reason you begin to have doubts later on is that the brain checks back to see and finds that it's got this sudden ending. And no organ ever had that sudden chop off at the end. And so you begin to have second thoughts about it. But it does illustrate how important that starting bit is. Um, perhaps I can illustrate it again with uh, some more recordings. Uh, this time, uh, what we, these are entirely synthetic. Uh, what I'm going to do is to play you what is in effect just a sawtooth. It's just remember when we added all the harmonics together, we got that sawtooth. Well, it's going to be like that, but what I'm going to do is to uh, start it and stop it in different ways. We're not changing the harmonic content itself, and I'm going to turn the um, oscilloscope right down so that it's very slow and I think we'll then be able to see much more easily what's happening. Uh, and here we go. Ah, sorry, I didn't go quite far enough back. Let's try again. Well, I think you could see there that we were just turning it on and off. Suddenly on suddenly off. And it sounds very electronic, doesn't it? There's no question about that. Now we're going to turn it on rather more slowly and chop it off. A bit like the, uh, like the organ sound, like the backward piano sound. Sounds quite different, doesn't it? Now we're going to do it the other way around. We're going to start it suddenly and then let it decay. Again, quite different. Now we'll go up and down slowly. It's beginning to sound quite a lot different, isn't it? Now, you remember I said that the ear brain system seems to like a little bit of imperfection. We put a little bit of wobble on it now, what we call artificial reverberation, and it does this. It's almost beginning to sound as though it might be a a rather cheap violin, isn't it? Or something bowed. Not very, but a little bit. Now, the reason it doesn't sound very like it is that those are notes that you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't ever play on a violin on the open strings. But if we have the actual notes that correspond to the open strings of a violin, listen to this. 
entirely synthetic. It's our sawtooth waveform, which is not remotely like that of a violin, and yet it begins to sound a little bit like a rather nasty violin. And part of that is because they are the open notes that are characteristic of a violin. And this is another of the important points that crops up when we're dealing with psychoacoustic research. The actual musical context matters a great deal. Uh, and if you're listening to uh, sounds in uh, a musical situation, it's your re reaction to them is quite different from that if you're in a lab. Uh, you remember when we had the rubber rope, we got patterns with nodes at certain places, points where there was no displacement. With a plate, which is two-dimensional, we get lines where there's no displacement. Uh, and if I scatter sand on the plate, and I'll get out of the way of the television camera, you can see the sand going on, um, what will happen is that when I start to bow, the sand will dance around where there's a lot of vibration, and it will tend to collect near the lines where there's no vibration. Well, it's always a bit dangerous to predict what you're going to do, but I always like to do it here and see what happens. What I'm going to try to do is to produce a St. Andrew's cross, uh, two diagonal lines, with a little semicircle in each of the quadrants. <laughs> and <laughs> we, we do that by placing two fingers on so, and bowing there. And... Uh, <laughs> Now, since the St. Andrew's Cross is Scottish, Scottish, and I happen to be English, um, what I'll try to do now is to repeat that pattern, but to add a St. George's Cross as well <laughs> uh, on top. Uh, and you'll notice that not only do we get a different pattern, <coughs> but the note that it produces is different. I think we've got enough sand on now. Now, to do that, we need three fingers on it, like that, and to bow it between two of them. And there we get the St. George's Cross added to it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I usually say at this point that the, that the one thing I can't do is a Welsh dragon. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> that's a bit beyond me. But there is one more pattern. You could go on doing this all night. It's great fun. I said I enjoyed doing demonstration. And it's the sort of thing that you could go on forever doing because there are very large numbers of modes and they all have their characteristic frequency. Um, one that always intrigues me is one which has a perfect circle. Although this is a square plate, it has a perfect circle with various radial lines. It's much more difficult to get than the others, but we'll, we'll see if we can get it. No. No, that's not it. That's not, that, <laughs> that's not a perfect circle. There it is. Two more demonstrations which uh, will bring us back to the um, psychoacoustic uh, element which uh, I said at the beginning I think is all important. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, in this group, show you uh, what happens when an audience becomes brainwashed? Uh, I don't know whether you're aware that uh, lecturers very frequently brainwash their audiences. In fact, I've done it several times already this evening. Um, what I mean is that if I want you to hear a particular effect, then uh, I have to prepare you for it. I have to lead you up to it. If I simply just did the experiment without telling you anything at all about it, you probably wouldn't, the first time, hear the effect that I want to hear. But by preparing you for it, by brainwashing you as it were, I can get you to hear what I want. And I think it's justified in, because you've got a short time in a lecture, you haven't time to listen to things over and over again, uh, and uh, provided I'm brainwashing you into hearing something that I, is right and I know is there, then I think it's justified. But this will... I think demonstrate just how powerfully this technique can work and then I'll say why uh, it's important in other ways. It's a record of some very, very crude synthetic speech and it starts with the buzzing sound of the vocal cords. 
Well, that's the sort of buzzing you would get for a sentence. Um, the, of course, that's a sentence which is being said all on one note. You know, it's frightfully dull, but you can understand it perfectly well, and although it's not very interesting. It's that, that kind of speech. It was on one note. Well, now the next thing you have to do is to make s and ch sounds, and you do that by taking white noise, remember we had that at the beginning, and you chop it up into little bits, and it sounds like this. Now we'll add those two together. Well, we're still a long way from real speech. The next thing you have to do is to put in the effect of all the cavities in the nose and throat. And some of those, of course, are what determines that it's my voice rather than your voice. Some of them are what determines the vowel sound. And they, we, we have some control over those. And there are really four frequency regions which we have to get right if we want to get a vowel to sound right. And if those frequencies are all bunched together, we get a sort of R sound. If they're split into two, too high and too low, we get an E sort of sound. And depending on where we put them, so we get our different vowel sounds. Well, now in this recording, we didn't put all the four regions in, we only put one. So it's very, very crude, and I don't think you will understand what is being said, but let's just try. Well, you can probably tell that it's speech, and if you've heard it before, you may even know what it is, but I doubt whether you would otherwise. Now I'm going to do the brainwashing bit. I'm going to tell you what the recording said. What it said was, sounds of music can be used for the synthesis of speech. Sounds of music can be used for the synthesis of speech. Now I'm going to play exactly the same recording again. <laughs> well, I hope that convinced you that brainwashing is a powerful tool. You see, what I've done now, I hope you don't object, but I've actually changed you. You're not the audience that came in. Uh, when you came in, you were an audience that hadn't heard that. Now you're an audience that has heard it, and so your response is different. And this really uh, focuses attention on one of the big problems in psychoacoustics, psychophysics. Every time you do an experiment, you change the person who is your victim. And I suppose what we would really like is tens of thousands of clones of identical people. So we could use them for one experiment and then throw them away. <laughs> and then, of course, we would, we would be sure that we had an, an un, uh, uh, untarnished individual each time. But, of course, you can't do that. And you have to make allowances. You have to keep disguising the experiment and coming at it in all sorts of different ways in order to get the effect you want. But, of course, uh, this is... If it wasn't for this uh, ability of the brain to do that, we wouldn't be able to exist. That's how we learn to speak. Um, that's how we learn to adapt to circumstances. I'm sure you've all had a, a visitor overseas whose native language isn't English, uh, and the first day you think, oh dear, I'm never going to get by, I can't really understand him very well. And then on the third day you say, by Jove, your English has improved. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it isn't his English that's improved at all. It's, you have become brainwashed, you have become tuned in. And in fact, if, I'd, if instead of telling you what was on that record, I'd played the same record to you about five or six times, you would have understood it. You would gradually have picked up a word at a time, you would have recognized a word, and then gradually built it up. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever heard uh, a pilot talking to the control tower, uh, and you wonder how on earth ever, uh, any plane ever landed, because the, 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 the speech is so garbled. But of course the pilot is brainwashed. He knows what words he's listening for and he's heard them before on that very restricted system. So it's all right. And as I say, all the time, all uh, the days of our lives really, we are continually using this ability. And whenever you hear a sound, the first thing the brain does is to sort of flip through the memory banks
to find whether we've heard that one before. And another of the clues to the reason why we can separate out the violins from the oboes and so on in the orchestra is that we've heard them all before separately. And so we have stored in our brains the necessary uh, clues which help us to separate them out. Well, just to finish with, this is really just for amusement only, I think. This is a, a rather old now recording of a computer uh, synthesizing some sounds. And it's interesting because of what I've just been talking about. The computer is synthesizing it very, very crudely. But because I think you will all know the tune, uh, you will be able to interpret it very well without any difficulty. Because you're already brainwashed, not by me, but by somebody else who sang the tune to you a long time ago. Uh, the computer does it in three styles. The first time it's just a simple electronic sound. The second, I think you will hear two instruments. And the third, I think you will hear three instruments. Um, if you do hear the three instruments, it's really because your brain I is so clever that it's, it's done the analysis and separated them out. Well, as you can see, that's fairly straightforward electronic type sound. Nothing very special about it. Now, if you can hear a sort of honky-tonk piano, that's more in your imagination than in the waveform. Because if you examine the waveform, it's not a bit like a piano. Well, that speech synthesis was even cruder than the one that we played before. But because you know the tune and you know the words, you had no difficulty in understanding it. And as I said, uh, the real reason that you can hear it is that you've got splendid brains. So I think that's the point on which I have to stop. Thank you. <laughs>